This book is called The Final Curtsy, and it, it's the memoirs of um, the Queen's first cousin, Margaret Rhodes. Um, she was the daughter of Baron Elphinstone, and the Queen Mother was her aunt. And I came across her by accident, really, um, through her daughter, one of her daughters, who said to me, apropos of nothing in particular, we always think there's a book in Mum. And apparently, Mum, who lives in the Great Park at Windsor in her grace and favour, has been bashing out her life story on an old jumped up typewriter with a ribbon for about 30 years. And I went down to see her and there was this pile of yellowing paper and it was her memoirs. And I took it home and I read it through and I thought, God, there is a book there that it needs a bit of help. So Margaret asked me to put these memoirs together, providing the Queen approved, and the Queen did approve. So we got the Queen's permission and we went ahead and did it. And um, but no one would publish it. So Margaret decided to go for, uh, well, it wasn't, no, it wasn't pillow talk. It was just really sort of interesting anecdotal stuff um, about so many people, about members of the royal family. So Margaret decided to self-publish. But we didn't really need to do that in the end because somehow the uh, the Daily Mail got wind of it, and before we knew where we were, it was being serialised for three successive weeks. And after that, all sorts of people took it up, Telegraph, Times, and also television, Margaret was on the screen. And um, the book came out, and it was a tremendous success. And it's called The Final Courtesy, simply because Margaret Rhodes had the only really authentic account of the death of the Queen Mother. Because not only was she her, not only was she her lady in waiting, but she was also her niece and her friend, and the Queen Mother only lived around the corner. And after the Queen Mother died, um, Margaret was there, sort of officiating. And in this book, there was the only really authentic account of the Queen Mother's death. And um, after the great lady had died, Margaret went back to Royal Lodge at Windsor to see how the staff were and popped up into the bedroom where the Queen Mother had been laid out. Dropped onto her knees, said a few prayers, then dropped her, the final, her final curtsy. And that's why it's called the final curtsy. And the Queen gave her the job of registering the, birth, the death at the Windsor Registry Office, or Registrar's Office, because it doesn't matter who you are, but you're the greatest lady in the land. Um, you have to have your death registered. So Margaret trotted along to um, the Registrar of Births, Marriages and Deaths in Windsor. And there was this terribly fearsome lady um, sitting behind a desk. And Margaret had to tick all the boxes. And this extraordinary woman said to Margaret, occupation of husband. And Margaret said, King, Emperor of India. And the woman said, right, took the box. Margaret said after she, she thought um, the Queen Mother would be very amused by that. But it's full of anecdotes. And um, Margaret also worked for MI, um, MI6 during the war. She was a big game hunter, explorer. Um, she lived in Buckingham Palace during the war and um, she had her own apartment there. And she, actually she was given um, uh, a butler's pantry for her um, kitchen, but it didn't have a fridge. And she didn't know how to keep them, the milk cold. So she used to put it out on the window ledge and the master of the household came up and reprimanded her because he thought that defacing the front of the, pa of the palace having these milk bottles out of the window ledge. And um, oh, she, Margaret's done everything. Uh, you name it, she's done it. And 
Oh yeah, there's a wonderful story about her when she was having tea with um, the Queen, um, who was then Princess Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth and George VI on the terrace at Windsor. And they could hear these Anglo-American um, voices. And King George VI said, oh my goodness, I've forgotten. And Eisenhower, um, General Eisenhower is coming to visit and i completely forgotten. I don't want them to see us here having our tea. So they all dived under the table and hid under the tablecloth until Eisenhower had gone by. And he must have been playing D-Day at that time. Incredible. All sorts of anecdotes. Um, but it's a great success. Sold lots and lots, thousands and thousands of copies, I think. I think 38,000 in hardback, and then it went into paperback. Yeah, but it's serialization that did it. It just took off. It hit a chord. I think the chord was that it wasn't sort of pillow talk, it, and it was full of anecdotes. And of course, photographs from Margaret's personal photograph album, all sorts of informal shots of the royal family. And they were, and they, they weren't very good pictures as pictures go, but historically they were incredibly important. And she's just a very game old bird, and um, she gave a party to um, to launch the book. And I was invited, and she said, "Just come down in a sweatshirt and jeans, dear boy." She said. And I thought, well, no, perhaps not, and. Um, I thought, I won't do the whole hog, I won't wear a suit. I wear jeans, but I wear a jacket and a shirt. And I'm so glad I did, because walked into the room, and there was the Queen, and there were the Queen and Prince Philip, surrounded by babies crawling all over the floor, and all Margaret's great-grandchildren, and uh, it was just the family, drinking gin and tonics. Great. Great fun. Its husband died. Um, Dennis, but the D-E-N-Y-S, of course. She didn't have, no, I mean, she was at a terrible loss, and the Queen Mother came to her rescue and said, would you like to be my lady-in-waiting companion? And that's what she did, until the Queen Mother died. And uh, she went on all the jobs for the Queen Mother, but of course they, she was the niece of the Queen Mother. Um, Margaret's mother was the Queen Mother's eldest sister. And uh, she was... The thing she got up to with her travels, and she knew virtually every crowned head of Europe, in Europe, um, everywhere. And, and when I said the anecdote, she was incredible. And somehow it just, it hit the market. It hit the market at the right time too, because it was just before the wedding of William and Catherine Middleton, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. Um, so yeah, royalty was in vogue. Well, the publisher just decided there must be a readership in, the, in Middle England. Daily Mail readers, Daily Telegraph readers, mm -hmm. people like that. And he was absolutely dead right. I mean, Margaret th thought it's wonderful because God knows how many publishers turned her down. And uh, she said, you know, I can say sucks to all these people who turned me down. How she got into MI6, I don't know. But she did. And, um, no, there she was. Hang on, let me talk about it. Bear with me. Sorry about this. I will find it. Oh, yeah, print, um, George VI slept with a revolver beside his bed. Uh, yeah, secret army. I tiptoed into the world of work, work with a difference when I finished my short and typing course. She used to go on her bike from Windsor Castle where she was staying at the time. I wanted to do my bit as the saying went, and joined the, the Women's Royal Naval Service, the Wrens. Um, but for some now forgotten reason, I found myself in an MI6 as a small cog in the shadowy world of espionage. It was all dreadfully hush-hush, and for an impressionable 18-year-old, tremendously mysterious. I reported each day with some trepidation to an office disguised as passport control. 
near St James's Park Underground Station. Perhaps it was passport control on the ground floor, but upstairs we were at MI6. The big chief, um, the big chief, M, to James Bond fans, hid behind the letter C. He wrote in green ink, and godlike powers were attributed to him by us, under, by us underlings. Years later, I was told that the spy, Kim Philby, had at one time been in line for the C job. He would probably have written in red ink. My department coordinated the work of our secret agents in the Near East. They all seemed to travel by CAC. Cake, CAC. Um, then I went to work for the deputy director with a very nice lady whose husband was an agent. I remember her distress when he broke his ankles, dropping by parachute into occupied France. With the ever vigilant Gestapo on, on their trail, mobility could mean the difference between life and death to our agents. I never learnt his fate, but I hoped so much that he survived. One of my daily tasks was to read every single message transmitted by our spies all over the world. It's fascinating but frightening too. I knew all about Germany's wartime race for nuclear weapons being conducted at their heavy water plant in Norway. And it was a tremendous relief when in 1943 a team of British trained Norwegian commanders succeeded in blowing up the plant. The Special Operations Executive, SOE, described it as one of the most daring and successful acts of sabotage in, Second War, in the Second World War. I was also aware of the Pienemunde project on the Baltic coast where the Germans were developing their new secret weapon, a rocket to be launched on London and the South East and the building of the rocket launching sites in Holland and France with the aim of bringing Hitler to its knees. It was to be Hitler, Hitler's last throw. Um, in 1943 it was scary to know that the V1 and V2 rockets were sloping up long before they actually fell on us. Forewarned was forearmed and one of the girls with whom I worked and shared a flat with in Chelsea went to bed every night wearing a tin hat. Um, and so it goes on. The final curtsy. Saturday the 30th of March 19, 2002 will be etched in my memory forever. Although it started like any other day at the Garden House, my home in the Rolling Cave in Windsor Great Park, which had been granted to me by my first cousin, the Queen, 22 years earlier. Um, my home was a short drive from the castle and almost around the corner from the Royal Lodge the weekend retreat of the Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, who was my mother's youngest sister and my aunt. Um, this house was very special as far as Queen Elizabeth was concerned, and she left her mark on it. She had been part of my life for as long as I could remember, and as the years passed, she seemed immortal. She had, however, been unwell since Christmas 2001, I suppose I had been steaming myself for the worst. But back to that March Saturday, it was sunny and bright, and the usual chores like exercise in the dark had to be undertaken. And then about 11 o'clock, the telephone rang. It was Sir Alistair Aird, my aunt's private secretary, warning me that the end seemed close. She had been receiving regular visits from our local doctor, Jonathan Holliday, the apothecary, to the household at Windsor. And on the morning of her death, he was joined by Dr. Richard Thompson, the physician to the Queen. They concluded that she would not last the day. I'm skipping bits of it. Um, hang on. Since 1991, I had been a woman of the bedchamber to my aunt, a mix of lady in waiting and a companion. And in our final weeks, I went to the Royal Lodge every day usually around 11 or 12, and I had lunch with her, the meal being set on a cart table in the drawing room. I tried to amuse her with snippets of news that might interest her. It was difficult to get her to eat much, but all she could usually manage was a cup of soup, although her chef, her page, and I spent a lot of time trying to think of dishes that might tempt her. It was wonderful to see her every day, and I'd take her little bunches of early daffodils and primroses, anything that was sweet smelling. Sorry. The days passed in this fashion until that telephone call. 
Um, as I arrived at the Royal Lodge, I saw that the Queen's car was there. I went straight to my aunt's bedroom and found her sitting in, the, um, in her armchair. The Queen was beside her, wearing riding clothes. She had been alerted while riding in the park, her broom always carrying a radio link to the castle. The nurse from the local in the surgery and my aunt's dresser, our royal household to speak for ladies maid, were also there. My aunt's eyes were shut, and thereafter she did not open them or speak another word. The doctors came and went, but the nurse, the dresser, the dresser and I stayed throughout. John Overden, Overden, the parish priest of the chapel of St George's at Windsor, arrived and went straight into Queen Elizabeth's bedroom. He knelt by my aunt's chair, holding her hand and praying quietly. He also recited a Highland lament, I am going now into the sleep. Quotes off. He later told me that he was sure she knew what was happening because she squeezed his hand. She was 101, a very great age. She, arrived in, she had arrived in the time with horse-drawn carriages and was le leaving it in, having seen men walking on the moon. I took a break, but when I came back, she had been put to bed. She looked so peaceful. At this point, the Queen returned, accompanied by Princess Margaret's children. John Overton also came back, and we all stood round the bed when he said the prayer. Now let us thou, my servant, depart in peace. We all had tears in our eyes, and to this day I cannot bear that being said without wanting to cry. cry. Queen Elizabeth died at 3.15 in the afternoon on 30th of March 2002. She just slipped away, and her death certificate said that the cause of death was extreme old age. The evening passed in rather a blur. I spent it at the council, as the Queen asked me to. Later, um, I went, the next day, I went back to the Royal Lodge and went to the Queen Mother, the Queen Elizabeth's bedroom. Uh, the dresser asked me if I'd like to see, had asked me if I'd like to see my aunt. She looked lovely and almost younger, death having wiped the lines away. I knelt by her bed and said a prayer for her. Then I stood up and gave her my final curtsy. Later, I was deputed to register my aunt's death at the Windsor Registrar's office. I was shown into the room of a rather fierce-looking lady and we went through the formalities while she ticked the relevant boxes. At a certain point, she fixed me with a beady, with a beady eye and asked, quote, Right, what was the husband's occupation? Quotes off. It seemed a superfluous question. However, after a second's hesitation, I answered, King, last emperor of India. I think Queen Elizabeth might have found that almost amusing. I skipped lots of it, but that's the rough summary.